Kia ora koutou. Um, I, my, my co-facilitators are on their way, um, but I think we might kick things off and they'll come and pick up uh, when they join us. So, uh, first of all, tēnā koutou katoa, ngā mihi kia koutou. Ko te mea tuatahi, ka mihi atu ki a rātou kua mene ki te pō, kua whetu rangitia a o te rā ki ngā mate kei runga i a tātou katoa. A moi mai, moi mai o te atu. A ko rātou tie rā te hunga mate ki te hunga mate, ko tātou tēnei a noho ora nei, mauri ora ki a tātou katoa. Tēnei te mihi ki a koutou, hui nei mō tēnei, Wānanga mō ngā mea e pāna ki te tariti o Waitangi. He mihi hoki ki ngā kai whakarite o tēnei ahipō, ngā hui o tēnei wiki. Ahako he mihi poto, he mihi mai o hā ki a koutou. Anō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā tātou katoa. Welcome everyone. Ko Cowan Jones tōku ingoa, he uri ahau o Ngāti Kahununu. So my name's Cowan Jones. Uh, I'm, my iwi is Ngāti Kahununu uh, and I'm an Associate Professor at the Faculty of Law at uh, Te Hiringawaka, Victoria University of Wellington. And I work primarily on issues relating to Te Tariti or issues affecting Māori and other Indigenous peoples. And tonight's event is the final session in to Hiringawaka, Victoria University of Wellington's Leadership Week, which has been a week of free webinars, which is designed to spark action on the issues that matter. And tonight we're going to be talking about Te Tiriti o Waitangi as a foundation for creative change. But uh, before we go any further, um, I would just like to begin with, uh, open up really with a karakia. And given the time of year that we are, it is Matariki, and I want to come back and talk a little bit about Matariki and why that might be relevant to how we engage this evening. Um, but I'll just start uh, with this short karakia. Uh, matariki te tipua, Matariki te tawhito, Tau mai te wairua, mai ngā ira atua ki ngā ira tangata ti hei mauri ora. Kia ora koutou. So, um, at this point I was going to hand over to my co-facilitators to introduce themselves, um, but we'll get them to say a little bit about themselves when they, when they join. Um, I'm very pleased to be uh, part of a session here with uh, Tamitha Paul and Rihanna Mora, uh, both uh, people who are working and engaged with these issues in different kinds of ways. Uh, Tamitha, a former student here, and uh, Rihanna, a current student of Te Hiringawaka. So I do want to come back, I mentioned, come back to talk a little bit about Matariki. Uh, because that is the time of year that we're in. Um, pe people might know Matariki as, as the Māori New Year. Uh, Matariki is, is a star cluster, and it appears or reappears in our skies at this time of year. And uh, people think of it as the Māori New Year because it's a time when uh, traditionally your harvesting was finished, uh, your kind of winter food stocks were plentiful. And so it was a time when you could devote your energies to other things. Um, and you could devote your energies to reflecting on thinking about the year that has passed. What were some of the successes and some of the failures um, over the past year? And then what are the things that you might want to do to change and to innovate and make a plan to do that. So Matariki is very much a time for reflection, for innovation and for planning. And so I'd like to encourage you to keep that in mind as we as we talk about these issues relating to Te Tiriti o Waitangi. Now just to give you a little bit of a sense 
about uh, how we're thinking this session might go this evening. Um, once my co-facilitators turn up, we will each take a, a turn facilitating part of the session. Uh, and so I'll begin and, and I'll start by touching on some of the opportunities that a Tiriti framework might provide. And then uh, hopefully Tam will be here to take us through thinking about some of the uh, current issues and, and urgent issues that are in front of us, which Te Tiriti might help us to work through. And then uh, Rihanna will point us to uh, some, some of the transformational potential really of Te Tiriti. We're hoping to keep the discussion um, relatively conversational and intending to um, put questions to each other and have some conversations amongst ourselves, but we're certainly aiming to leave some time at the end for some questions uh, and discussion time uh, with all of you. And so I, th I think you might have seen from the slide at the start that there's a an opportunity to put in um, your questions into the question and answer um, space and then then that can be others can can um, upvote um, things that they would like to talk about that appear there so if you use that we can we can pick up on uh, on those issues there and I'm very pleased now to see um, Timothy and Rihanna uh, join us um, I've just been explaining the kind of format of the session and uh, that we intend to keep this quite conversational, that we're each going to take a turn sort of co-facilitating part of it. Uh, I've introduced myself briefly, but now might be an opportunity just for each of you um, to introduce yourselves. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, yeah, I saw this thing recently on um, social media that said uh, we need to decolonise time. So that's what we're doing here, just running on um, running on uh, Māori time. No, just kidding. Um, but yeah, kia ora koutou. Um, ko ai o, a heri tēnei no ngā te awa me wākau to tainui hoki. Uh, ko tēma te pōtō ku ingoa. Um, kia ora, my name's Tam. And um, as a brief background about around me, um, I was the Student Association President last year for BUSA and that was my full-time job and now I am a Wellington City Councillor for the Central City and I am responsible for climate change, young people and city safety. So yeah, kia ora koutou and thank you for joining us for our kōrero tonight. Well, tēnā tāko. Um, kia ora everyone, ko Rihanna tō ku ingoa, uh, ko Ngāti Parau me Te Aroa Tapuika uh, Oku Iwi. Um, so kia ora everyone, my name is Rihanna. Um, I am currently the University Council Student Representative for this year and next year. I've also uh, been on VUSA under the leadership of the great Tamitha Paul. <laughs> uh, I have also held executive positions on uh, Ngāranga Hotera, which is the Māori Law Student Society, um, as well as the Feminist Law Society. So kia ora everyone. Kia ora kōrua. So let's just kick into it then. Um, I said that I would start with a brief section of thinking about the opportunities of Te Tiriti. Uh, and really what I wanted to do partly was just to make sure we're all sort of starting with on, uh, on the same page in a sense. So I know there'll be lots of people who are joining us who work with the with Te Tiriti a lot and are very familiar with it and lots of the arguments and discussions and debates around it. Um, but I'm also aware that there might be people who, who don't have much of a background in, in Te Tiriti. So I just wanted to make sure that we had some key concepts that we're working with in common that, that we can focus on and think about. So just to, to give a little bit of a brief background then, um, where I wanted to start was just by pointing out if, and again, many people will be familiar with, with this, this background, but um, Te Tiriti signed initially in Waitangi in, at Waitangi in 1840, signed importantly by um, rangatira, by the leaders of various communities, 
um, and by William Hobson, of course, on behalf of the British Crown. So we've got an agreement between various rangatira, various leaders on behalf of their communities and the British Crown. And one of the things that we might look to when we're thinking about what, what that agreement is like or what the key exchange is, we can see that uh, one of the things that, that the British Crown is getting out of this exchange is a grant of some authority. So in the Māori text, and I'm going to use the concepts from the Māori text, um, the Māori text talks about kāwanatanga going to the British Crown. Kāwanatanga is a concept, uh, comes from the English word, the base word is kāwana, comes from the English word governor, kāwana, governor, kāwana, and kāwanatanga is those things to do with the governor or government, and we can think of it as a function of government. And what we see on the other side of that is the kind of key concept uh, that Māori are being guaranteed is this concept of tino rangatiratanga. And rangatiratanga, tino rangatiratanga, we can see the base word there, rangatira, meaning chief or leader. Rangatiratanga, those things to do with, with the chief, so chieftainship, and the tino at the start is an intensifier. So it's all those very special qualities of chieftainship. Um, and so one of the things that, that we might begin by noting is that Tetriti wasn't signed in, in a vacuum. Um, there was, there's, a, there's a whole background and context and history that's, that's important that sits behind that. We've just got a, a, a sort of brief few minutes to introduce some of these ideas here. Um, but one of the things that is important is the 1835 Declaration of Independence, which a uh, group of chiefs in the North declared that they collectively exercised authority, independence, sovereignty. Uh, and so this is a precursor to Te Tiriti o Waitangi, and it's part of why this grant of kāwanatanga is, is so significant, because it marks a shift between the rangatira exercising all authority in Aotearoa to opening up space for this other form of governmental authority to take place, to be exercised. Now, many people will be aware about the fact that there's an English text and a Māori text of, te of the treaty, and um, that, that there are some debates about the different meanings uh, between those. And of course, the English text uses the word sovereignty. The Waitangi Tribunal has been pretty clear that uh, those rangatira who signed on the 6th of February in 1840, would not have and could not have given up their sovereignty. Um, and so what they were providing for was this grant of kāwanatanga, this ability for the British Crown to exercise some governmental authority um, in the intention, the tribunal says, was that that would be in relation to the settler population. But the key point really for me, I think, that I'd, I'd like you to think about is that no matter how you characterize that grant of authority, um, it, it's, it's not a small thing. It's quite a, a significant shift from Māori exercising all authority to opening up a space for another form of authority to happen. And by the same token, the concept of tino rangatiratanga is by no means a small uh, concept or a small guarantee. This is a significant guarantee about the exercise of that absolute chiefly authority. So what we end up with is a sharing of public power. Te Tiriti doesn't set out the terms on which, the, the precise terms on which that public power is going to be exercised. And so we have since 1840 been working through um, trying to understand in, in specific circumstances what that relationship between tino rangatiratanga and kāwanatanga might look like, what that means in specific contexts. Um, and so that's a, that's a very brief um, capturing of a couple of key concepts that are in Te Tiriti. Uh, and, and what I'd like to turn to um, Tam and, and Rihanna here to ask them is how you're both people who who work with Te Tiriti in different ways 
um, and I'd be interested in hearing from you um, how you see those those two concepts and how you you talk about the relationship they create in, in some of the work that you do. Kia ora, Carwin. Um, I think for me, one of the big things is trying to dispel some of the underlying assumptions that people have around what is reasonable um, or what is consultation. And I think that's because there hasn't been enough, um, at least day-to-day -day discourse around how these two concepts should interact. What is the relational sphere between the two is something that I'm really interested in. And it's not a sphere in which um, Rangatiratanga only operates in accordance with the Kawanatanga framework, but rather how do we empower the exercise of Rangatiratanga um, in its own right? And so it's sort of going beyond, um, for example, consulting, uh, consulting with Māori and actually trying to step towards how do you empower Māori um, to be involved in the decision-making process? So do you have Māori um, at the decision-making table and are you listening to them? Because I think sometimes Māori views can get balanced out um, in the process in which we call consultation. And so there really needs to be a recognition that, you know, the exercise of rangatiratanga informs the substantive decision. Um, it's not just a procedural um, sort of tick box exercise. And so you have to make sure that whatever outcome um, that you're deciding is good for Māori. It's not sufficient to say that you talk to uh, two Māori people that you know. Um, so that's my experience. Yeah, and I think, to be honest, uh, um, I, I think about it in, in relation to the issues that we deal with, and so I might just like park that question till I talk about some of those issues, because it's um, hard to conceptualise unless we're actually talking about those, and I don't want to take a deep dive into those just yet, so I'll leave it at that if that's okay okay so that, that i think that's really really helpful for both of you because um it will be useful to talk about these kind of big concepts kawanatanga and tinoranga tiratanga in relation to specific issues because i think that helps to take that kind of abstract and make it quite real and concrete and practical. And, you know, I think it's really helpful, Rihanna, to raise that idea of those spheres of authority. And that's a that's a, a way in which the Waitangi Tribunal has talked about it. It's a way in which um, the, the Mātikia Mai Aotearoa, the Working Group on Constitutional Transformation, talk about it. So that it's thinking about um, both, uh, both what what might be involved with tino rangatiratanga, what is involved with kawanatanga, but importantly, what the relationship is between them and how you, you manage that space in between, how you give effect to the, the, the authority that, though, that are exercised in those different spheres um, separately as well. And, and that point about thinking around going, ensuring that Tiratanga is reflected in, in decision-making authority, I think is really important. We've just had some uh, a report about reforming the Resource Management Act come out in the last couple of days, which is proposing a Māori advisory board. Um, and so there's a real question around, well, it, it, advice isn't being part of the decision-making, and so how does that reflect Tinoranga Tiratanga in that way? So both really helpful kinds of points. I don't know whether either of you had, um, Tam, you mentioned you, you want to come back to talk about some specific issues. So maybe that's that's actually where we, where we move to now. And I will hand over to you to kind of introduce the, how, some of these urgent and current issues that we're dealing with and how Te Tiriti and a, a Tiriti framework might, might be relevant there. Mean so yeah. Um, fully preface this with um, I am not a law student nor a law professor, and I don't understand tetiriti in in the sense of, well, I do, but not not in the in a legal sense. So I'm thinking about it in a practical sense and how it's applied and how the current systems that we're constrained by um, prevent us from making transformational change. 
And so when I go back home and my friends are like, so what are you up to? What's the, what's the goals? What's the plan? Is it, is it prime minister? I get all the time. I was like, actually, no, what I'm really into is constitutional transformation. And when you're talking about that with real people, that as a concept just seems so far away. But when you break it down into issues that people really care about, you can see that the changes that we need to move towards and the mindsets that we need to change and shift can only come from within system change. And so I wanted to talk about a few issues um, and how they are relevant to systems and um, really keen to hear um, both of your whakaro on these as well. So um, I picked a few issues that um, are relevant right now or that I care about quite a lot. And I just wanted to talk about how the current system that we have um, reinforces or perpetuates those issues. Um, so the first, um, issue that I wanted to talk about is um, it's kind of a collection of, it seems that we're having a bit of a, this year has been the year for difficult conversations or challenging conversations. Um, and we've seen that through the Black Lives Matter movement um, within indigenous communities, really looking within and, and asking ourselves what forms of anti-blackness do we carry and do we need to dismantle? And also with the statue conversation um, and, and all of those kind of conversations, even over the last few days with dominoes and their hoha tongue up. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're, we're having all of these conversations and they're really being brought to the fore where everybody feels like they can participate in them. And so I've been thinking a bit about how the system that we have, so the Westminster system, how that um, reinforces um, how that reinforces racism in our society, but I'm also going to talk a bit about climate change and a bit about our about um, COVID-19 as well. So when it comes to, I think, talking about race or understanding race and thinking about, because obviously we have all of these issues that have been brought to the fore, and I think we, we're having these conversations, but it's hard to know where to go from there because how do you implement an anti-racist policy within an inherently racist system? And... When I when I think about when I'm when I'm talking, I always think about things in the way that I talk to my friends back home. So when I'm talking to them and and I'm you know I'm trying to describe to them what um, what's wrong with the current system that we have, I think about Parliament and the kind of constitutional principles that it creates and expresses through the policy that it makes. So one of those is is the rule of law and how law and order is supreme in this society that we have and how that is a principle that was brought over. Um, through colonization and how that was a really key principle um, in, in, Brit in British society. And to me, that means that law is supreme and that is upheld through the different systems. So through the police and through, um, you know, the, just the way that we live our lives is within the constraints of the law. But when you think about who created that law, because, you know, when you're looking at um, our, our prison statistics and those kinds of things, a lot of people will say, well, if you, if you obey the law, then you have nothing to worry about. But when we look at the statistics and break those down, we see that non-Māori, oh, sorry, that Māori are more times more likely to appear before a judge, um, many times more likely to receive a, um, a criminal conviction and harsher sentencing than their non-Māori counterparts. And so, when we're thinking about the rule of law and how that is upheld through all the different institutions around us from the health system, the education system, the justice system and police, you know, that's a massive conversation that we're having right now. That is upholding a law that has been created by, you know, if we're going to call a spade a spade, white men, old white men and their, and their need to protect their private property. And that is what the law is created around. So if you, if you have a, a kind of if your society is structured around the rule of law and upholding that then how can we ever make space for anybody that isn't an old white man let's be honest because that is what it reinforces and so when i think about implementing policies or or adding adding in you know initiatives that actually deal with the racist institutions that we have built up around us those will always be insufficient because they don't get at the heart of the system that is built up to protect these people and private property so um, and then we move to climate change. Um, so that, I guess all of the, the way that I think about it is um, with climate change, we have people pushing for various different um, policies that might be able to um, change the way that we deal with that, whether it's the emissions trading scheme or, 
or whether it's getting more electric vehicles and you know getting more people owning those particularly at the city council a lot of our plans to be the first carbon zero capital are premised on the assumption that everyone will get, yeah get an electric vehicle and everyone will cycle to work and and all of these things but it doesn't get at the heart of what's wrong with the capitalist system so it goes back to that systemic stuff because what i've found is that you go round and round in circles and you find all of these solutions but they're just plasters on what is a broken crumbled archaic system that actually needs to go and so um, when I'm thinking about climate change and capitalism, that is premised on the mindset that our natural taonga, our, um, the things that are in the ground, the things that flow through our rivers, the things that are in our moana, all of these things are um, disposable and that they can be extracted or degraded in order to build up our capital. Um, and so, and another thing that I'm realizing is that so much of our system is built up around protecting private property and, and there's a real mindset that people are entitled to their private property and that's something that's been carried over through the Westminster system that we have, which is, pre is heavily, um, you know, structured around protecting private property and people's rights, you know, their God-given right to own something and to have the exclusive right to own what that is. And that drives a very individualistic mindset that is inherent within our society. And so when, so for example, when we're trying to deal with climate change on a city council level, if we're trying to remove private parking to make space for cycleways so that people can get to and from work in a sustainable way, um, even the idea to remove a car park creates so much vitriol from the community because in people's minds, they have a God-given right to park their car there that they own. And it's the same with land. We're having a conversation currently around building more density within the city so that we can create more homes so that people actually have somewhere to live and you don't have 50 to 100 people turning up to a flat viewing. However, people that have their one house on their one plot of land, they they believe that that's their that that's their kind of right to have that land and to keep that there and it is because that is what is protected by the system that we have and if we want to move to a mind frame or a collective mind frame where we are thinking collectively and we're thinking about our actions and the decisions that we make every single day in a collective sense that's not something that can come through a system that is premised on individualism and your right to owning pr private property you know so that's i guess goes back to I guess it's like that ruthless individualism that is expressed through parliament and what I've found is that even when you have what is it like 29% of MPs are Maori it doesn't matter because if those constitutional um, principles are premised around people's individual rights to own property and when it's so individual you can never get at the collective you can never get at the sense of people thinking collectively and and thinking what impact do, do my actions have on the collective? You know, what, what impacts does that have on the community and everybody around me? Um, and so I just wanted to talk very briefly about COVID-19 and I think that really showed a potential for how quickly systems can collapse. So we saw all around us, um, you know, the economy absolutely collapsed and that's something that we, prior to COVID, you know, we propped it up so high as something that cannot change or where there is no room. We saw the government come in and make changes that they wouldn't have even entertained had COVID not come around and things that we were told as the people that was not possible. Um, so, yeah, I think that really shows that radical change can happen and that, um, and that there, yeah, so I think that shows, yeah, that, that radical change can happen. And I think we've started to have a conversation about what systems we can have or, um, you know, we're, we're starting to have a conversation about whether the systems that we do have, whether they serve people in the collective sense or whether they serve people individually. So um, I think that's pretty much what I'm going to say. But I just had a few questions as well for, for Cohen and Reid to bring them in on this whole topic of... Um, you know, issues-based um, constitutional transformation. And I just um, wanted to ask Re what your thoughts are around, um, I guess, current issues and how they're relevant to Te Tiriti and um, I guess systems and how they actively uphold inequities within our society. I feel like I can't add much more to that, but I'll try. Um, so as an honor student, one of my seminars is actually on welfare and social security law. 
Um, and I've actually been really interested in looking at the wage subsidy um, that has sort of been introduced through COVID-19. And I think a lot of what you were saying, Tam, is about interrogating these underlying values um, mm. that we hold and what is um, manaki tanga. You know, we don't ask that question because a lot of our values actually don't consider um, tikanga or tikanga values. And so what I've really been interested in is this notion between like people who are deserving and people who are undeserving. Um, and I think that linking into your comments about um, the law being premised on the old white man and capitalism and sort of being able to bear the fruits of your labor, I think what we have seen is a government who perhaps cheapens the words such as aroha, such as care, such as um, manakitanga, in terms of you know providing the wage subsidy. However, if we actually look at the wage subsidy, it's really only been implemented because it affects uh, the most privileged people, um, people who you know would otherwise have high paying jobs, rather than uh, the single Māori mother on the benefit um, who has to provide for her kids. And so and I feel like we need to start interrogating um, these values and not just accepting sort of handouts where they, where they are given and uh, praising the government for being so caring when actually, who does it serve? Um, who do these policies actually serve? And it certainly isn't Māori. Um, so that's just my facard. Or, but perhaps, Carwin, um, you know, what kinds of policy changes or implementation do you think could reverse um, sort of some of the negative statistics about Māori? So I know you've done some work um, for the Justice Advisory Group, um, particularly in prisons. So I would just wondered, um, what's your whakaaro on that? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that came through very strongly with us in the in that justice sector work was, <coughs> uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, was that what people told us, what Māori communities told us, and what indeed what all the evidence suggested, and what a lot of um, Pākehā communities that we talked to told us as well, was that we needed to find solutions that were by Māori for Māori. Um, and so that, that really seemed to be at the heart of, of a lot of what people wanted to see happening within the justice sector. Um, Māori communities or people, Māori people that we talked to as part of that process told us that um, they'd seen elements of tikanga Māori be picked up and used in the justice sector, but it had been kind of divorced from the wider setting that it was in, the context that it was in. And so it, it didn't make sense, it didn't work because it wasn't grounded in the kind of whānau networks that um, that those those processes or those concepts were, were intended to be in. But I think that all kind of points to, um, I mean, that that's really the issue and that, that's the constitutional issue really is, is how to, um, achieve a kind of by Māori, for Māori approach across a range of things, because this is, of course, something that, that was raised in the context of healthcare and by the tribunal and that the Hawara report was to have a, a kind of independent Māori health authority that, that would, would guide that work. So, and it, it's what was behind the the constitutional working group, um, Mātake Mai Aotearoa, being established was that that what what people were seeing, what Maori were seeing, was having to um, well, being reactive or across a whole range of different subject areas. When actually the real question was that fundamental one about um, how those, those how decisions were being made and, and how um, the, the kind of different spheres of authority that that you raised earlier, Rihanna, were being recognised or not being recognised. And, and I think that, you know, the issues that you've raised, Tam, too, around things like uh, climate change is a really good example because that's, that's uh, something where it's quite clear that the way we've been operating and the system that's created the problem isn't able to produce an, a, a solution to how to deal with climate change, that you need to look outside that system that's created the problem. And one of the things that uh, Tetariti 
encourages us, us, encourages us to do is to think about different ways of operating, to draw on different tools, to engage different voices, to have different voices in the decision-making process. And we can see a little glimpse of that in, in some of the recent treaty settlements, for example, things like a settlement in relation to the Whanganui River, Te Awatupua, which, and, and, and this, you know, this is really just a small glimpse of what the potential might be, but what's happened there is that that settlement has cr created a different way, not just for the iwi of Whanganui to interact with, with the river, but it's required everyone to reconceptualize the way they relate to that river, the way they understand it, um, the, the way it's understood in a holistic sense, uh, the way in which communities are part of that river system. And it's those kinds of uh, ideas that, that help us to kind of ch change the way in which we think about things. And Te Tiriti provides um, a, a framework for starting those conversations, for drawing on those different tools and those different voices. Hard out. And I, I suppose what I just wanted to add was um, that although I think what turns a lot of people off when we talk about Te Tiriti is that they feel, I think when people don't understand what it is, they feel that it's a system that might only serve Māori or that is really just a process of, um, I guess, um, a process of, um, what's that word, re, re, when you give everything back. <laughs> what's that called again? We, you know, I feel like people think it is going to be a, a process Regions. that really... Yeah, yeah, I guess a, pro a process of reduce. And so I think a lot of people, therefore, don't see themselves reflected into Te Tiriti. But I think the really important part is that it offers an alternative to the current system that we have. Not only that, but if it is tikanga Māori, I think the, the important thing about tikanga Māori, no matter where you're from across Aotearoa, knowing that tikanga is adaptable, agile and flexible, but it is inclusive. And I think that's the most important element of it is that it is, it is inclusive of everybody that chooses to call Aotearoa home and it doesn't, it's not transactional. It doesn't ask you to have a transactional relationship because it doesn't ask of you. Um, it asks you to think collectively and to think about the ways in which you give back to your community. And so I think the, the, the most important part of this whole conversation is that we, I think we're all getting to the point where we can acknowledge that the system that we have only serves a particular portion of society. And that's not women, that's not takatāpui, that's not disabled people, you know, that's not any of those groups. And so I think we all need to get to the space where we can allow people to imagine a different society that could look different, that is inclusive to all. And I think, um, like I said before, Te Tiriti gives us all a place of standing here in Aotearoa because it encompasses all of us. Um, and so... I think there, there's like that high conceptual kind of understanding of it, but I think the other really important element is that it, that Te Ao Māori and Tikanga Māori, it provides practical solutions to the issues that are facing us as well. Um, you know, not just the governance space, not just the kawanatanga, not just the tinoranga tiratanga space, but with that tinoranga tiratanga space comes the re-indigenization of um, the solutions that we seek to the problems that we're looking at. So, you know, when I'm sitting around the table and I'm hearing people talking, you know, talking up like, oh, have you seen this new system about donut economics? Donut economics is not a new concept. This idea of having ecological ceilings, you know, having these limits, um, you know, these environmental bottom lines that you cannot, um, you cannot step past them. We've known about them. In fact, we know what those are intimately here in Aotearoa and within the Pacific. This idea of having social foundations or levels, or social bottom lines, like i.e. not letting people be homeless, not um, making people stay in unsafe homes or, um, you know, people being able to go out and have a night in town and not be afraid to, that they're going to be harmed or assaulted or harassed. Those, those concepts are all wrapped up and have been here for a long time. And we just need to get to a place where we can start to rediscover those and hone our memories in a way that allows us to rediscover those things. When I think about climate change, it's the cool trendy thing. And people are talking about regenerative ag agriculture and um, urban farming. That's a concept of marakai. That's, that's, you know, that's an indigenous concept. The concept of giving tangaroa a day of rest, a day in which we don't swim, we don't catch kai, we don't do anything, we let tangaroa rest. Those are 
non-transactional ways that we take care of the environment. And there are also non-transactional ways, collective ways that we look after our community, after whānau, after our hapu, after everybody in the community. And those are things that we have to reconnect with. So when I look at these new concepts, I think it's about actually reversing and trying to figure out actually what does titiriti look like in a 21st century context? How do we merge all of these, this melting pot of cultures that we have here in Aotearoa to find a system or to create or imagine a system that allows us to reconnect, re indigenize and find those solutions rather than looking outwards, I think we need to look inwards. So that's just my two cents on that. But Reed, did you want to um, talk a little bit about um, what, what can people do to actually, because we talk about titiriti as something that's like up there, but people in their everyday individual capacity can help us get to that level. So what does that look like? <laughs> yeah, look, I think it's important to try and bring the conversation back down to who is listening um, to us tonight. And I think there are lots of students here tonight, which I am so happy about, um, but also there's a lot of professionals here. And so what I really want to emphasize is that constitutional transformation is possible um, in your day-to-day -day lives because all of us hold positions of power and so it's about what do we do with those positions um, and how is Te Tiriti able to provide a framework for the decisions that we make um, or how we interact with people um, and how we have relationships with people. Um, and so, you know, humans are agents of change is sort of the title I would like to start off with. Um, and, you know, we make decisions every day. And so there's a potential for everyone to sort of make this um, a reality. And I just really want to stress and dispel this myth that tertidity is not isolated to Māori issues. Mm. And I think this whole conversation has actually shown that it's integrated into a spectrum of issues. Um, and often, in my position as a student representative in many different capacities, um, you know, as a university, we talk about being a values-based university. And we talk about the marae being at the heart of the institution. Um, and so something that I'm always pushing for at the council table is where are those values? In every single business case that you present to me, um, in every single decision that we make, where is tetidity? Uh, where is the marae at the heart of this institution? Because it's not enough to sort of tack um, the values in an appendix at the end and say, oh, by the way, um, this decision considers um, all the values of the university. And that's sort of going back to my point earlier, which is that tertidity and the values that it brings with it actually has to um, somehow colour, inform, or provide a central part um, of your decisions that you're making. So when you make a decision, is this good for our Māori students? Is this good for all students? Because are we showing manaki tanga? Um, you know, that is a value in which we need to see coming through. Um, and another thing is that when we're in these positions of power, I think it's really important to think about, are we listening? Um, and I don't think people talk a lot about sort of the notion of listening. Um, and so my sort of widow to everyone who is watching is that if you're a student leader or if you're a part of any professional organization, think about how you can give up power um, and not take up space or how can you make these spaces safe for conversations um, that need to be had, conversations about tetidity, um, how can the table be a safe space for Māori because it needs to be. Um, and just going off that sort of decision-making table point, I think that also imposes an obligation on people who are in these positions of power to build your capacity, build your capability. Um, you know, if you're, if you're calling yourself a, a treaty partner by virtue of being on this land, by living in New Zealand, um, I think you have an obligation to learn our history um, it's your history too. And how are you connected to tertidity? Because I think it's important for everyone to know their whakapapa. 
um, and your connection to this land and how you can be a good treaty partner. And, and it doesn't mean just going and learning your pepeha. It goes further than that. Connect with your maunga that you mahi to. Connect with your awa that you mahi to, you know. And just on that point, Tam, I mean, you were the first wahine Māori president of USA. Um, so how did how were you able to bring a te tiriti lens to an organisation which has traditionally been non Māori and actually serve the needs um, of a lot of white men in the past. Mm, yeah, yes. Um, so I think I think the the we even start with that question. Um, so I think the the really key thing is is really goes back to what you're just saying is that when you are at the table, like it's not just enough to be at the table, particularly if you're a woman, if you're Maori, if you belong to any community that's not represented around the table, it's not enough to just get into that position and be there if you know that you can bring more voices with you. So for example, um, when I would be at a table rather than me just being like, well, it's awesome to be at this table because I'm a Māori woman. That's just, that's that's not going further, that's not going further enough because I know that I can say, where is Naitauida at this conversation? Where is the Māori Students Association? Where is the Pacifica Students um, Council at this conversation? So it's it's not just about, you know, if you have the privilege to be able to get to that table, it's not just about getting in the door, it's about holding it open for those to come, you know, those, to come to join you at the table. And then when we're all at the table, we can start taking it apart and rebuilding our own table, you know, because we don't need that one. Um, so I think that that's the most important part is not getting complicit in that privilege and being able to see, okay, who needs to be at this conversation, you know, who needs to be at this table and what power can I give away so that they are able to um, bring more people with them to their table and, they're able to be there in a meaningful way. So like, you know, we said at the beginning, not just consultative kind of requirements and just giving a little bit of feedback, like how can they meaningfully be there and be agents of change to be able to, you know, make the make that change or drive any change that they want to make, I suppose. And I think it's about um, sort of actively seeking those voices and being able to uplift them. Mm. Um, that's something in which, you know, we did, as, as part of VUSA is we would actively make sure that the Māori Students Associations ha had a voice at that table. Um, and I think it's an excuse, to be honest, to say, oh, well, they didn't reply to my email. Um, mm. That's a common thing, mm. is when you're in an institution, everyone sends emails, but Māori don't speak through emails 99% of the time. And so if you go, oh, but I emailed them and they didn't reply, well, that's not good enough. Go to the Marae. Um, and, and go to their whare, knock on their door and say, hey, I've got a um, place for you. Will you come with me? Um, and so this is sort of a little bit of a random segue, but I'm going to go to Carlin. <laughs> um, so I'm really interested as an educator and as an associate professor of law, you know, what obligations do you think uh, perhaps tertiary institutions or um, you know, institutions that have authority to educate people, um, what, what obligations do you think they have in terms of sort of being the critic and conscience of society? Yeah, I mean, I think there are, I, I, I would think about both um, the, the obligations and the opportunities of um, participating in, in an institution which is dealing with both research and teaching. Um, so one of the things that, that you've both talked about already is that idea of creating space for other voices, um, recognising the privileged position that, you know, where we occupy positions of privilege, recognising that and thinking about how to um, bring other people along, how to give up some... Um, some power, some resources is, is often often what's at stake. And so I think in the for a university in the research space, one of the things that I constantly think about is, you know, how how do I leverage the the role of the university, the position that I occupy here, 
to to try and um, uh, make some space for for Maori voices. Um, and if I'm engaged in a research project relating to Maori, um, to think about well, how how can I kind of decenter myself as the academic, um, not think about the research project that I want to do, but to think about engaging with Maori communities to say, well, you know, what is, what are your research needs? What are the things that you'd like to work on? What is the capability or capacity that you might like to build that I can support with in conducting this research? And, and I think that that's really hard for a lot of, a lot of academics who, you know, one of the things that, that's really privileged about our position is being able to work on projects and research that we, we, we wish to. But, but kind of decentering ourselves and actually giving up some of the power um, about what are the things that we focus on. And in that universities do have a role as critic and conscience of society, I think it's incumbent on us to ensure that we are all um, centering Maori in our research. And I, I think this has become, I've seen it particularly visible in the context of some of the discussions around um, COVID-19 and the res government response to COVID-19, where people are proposing work, research, having those scholarly discussions around um, those issues, which are both public health issues, there are economic issues, there are issues about the exercise of state powers, all involved in this, this response. And I think it's really important that we centre Māori because one of the things we, one of the things we know, is that where the state has coercive powers, that Māori will have those powers exercised against them, will bear the burden of that. Where the economy is uh, suffers some blow, then Māori bear a disproportionate burden of that economic cost. Um, and we know that there are where where health resources are scarce and um, whether those resources are prioritized for issues when you're not centering Maori, where you're not adopting a, a Tariti framework to thinking about, or even an equity framework to thinking about how those health resources are delivered, then again, Maori are amongst the groups that that bear a disproportionate burden there. So it's really important for us as as, as researchers, as part of a part of an institution which is does have a role as a critic and conscience of society, that we are ensuring that those issues are centred in the work that we are doing. That we're thinking about, constantly reflecting on, uh, you know, what might what does what does this mean for Maori communities, and how can I centre those experiences in the work that I do? Yeah, that's my thoughts on that. I mean, and I, I suppose I just wanted to add, um, I see there's like a few questions, which we'll probably get to in a minute. I just wanted to add something. So I suppose it all does seem still very high level, but Rio obviously offered some practical um, ways that we can, um, we can, we can do this. So I think, I think the kind of key messages um, with this corridor is that the systems that we currently have around us constrain us in every possible way, no matter what issue you care about, whether you are environmentally minded and you care about climate change or the preservation of our indigenous biodiversity, or you want people to cycle and walk more, whether you're more um, interested in social justice and you're worried about the fact that babies are snatched out of their mother's arms and then thrown into state care, which is abusive, and then put into an education system that is so one dimensional, or whether it is that our health system disproportionately, um, you know, um, deals with in a negative way, I can't think of the word, uh, with Māori and Pacific people, you know, whatever it is that you care about, all of it can be, you know, we, we, can't, we can't rediscover the tools to deal with the issues until we get rid of the shackles that bind us, which are wrapped up in the system that we imported over here that doesn't work for anybody, especially not our increasingly diverse society. It's beautiful that we have so many cultures here in Aotearoa, but um, 
you know, we need to, this to be, Aotearoa to be a safe home for people and that means needing an inclusive system. However, when we think about systemic change and we think about, you know, those legends like Palmoana Jackson and um, Professor Margaret Mutu, and we think about how long they've been talking about this, it can be really off-putting and we can begin to feel really hopeless because we think to ourselves, oh my gosh, systems change, constitutional transformation is so far down the road, I might never see it in my lifetime. And so I don't know, like I don't want to, I'd rather go for a short term when, you know, a policy change or that. Thinking about constitutional transformation and, and, and really embedding that into your everyday life is the essence of being a good tipuna. And it's a long term game. And none of it, we might not see it in our lifetime, but that's besides the point. It's about being a good tipuna, no matter, we, no matter we, whether you're Māori, Pākehā, Tauiwi, whatever. You, you have to think about, you have to think down the road, right down the road. And the way we need to think about it is that we pick up our baton and we run it as far as we can and then we leave it in a place that our kids and their kids can pick it up and take it even further. And like Ree says, we make decisions every single day and as a collective that can be really powerful. We make decisions about what food we're going to buy, you know, do you go to McDonald's or do you support the local cafe? What clothes we get? Are we going to get something ethical or something secondhand or are we going to get something that someone got paid four cents an hour to make for us? We make decisions about what we do with our time. Do we get on the piss every night or do we actually take some time to reflect and think about ourselves and who we are and what the significance are? What sacrifices did your ancestors make for you to be here living in this country that, you know, for the problems that we have, we are pretty lucky to be here, especially right now. So what sacrifices did the people that you descend from, what did they have to sacrifice for you to be in this position? So we make these decisions every single day. And if we at least just be a bit more conscious about the decisions that we make, that is how we get somewhere. And if everybody is doing that, that is how we can get to somewhere where our kids can pick it up and have a decent chance at running it even further than we could take it. So I think especially when it comes to thinking about how we use our time. Like I think it's really important, particularly during this period of Matariki, it's a time where we are thinking and reflecting about ourselves and our place here where we stand in Aotearoa, thinking about how does te tiriti apply to my life? You don't have to be a lawyer, a politician, or any of the people that we prop up to be the ones that are going to make the change. Change seldom comes from an individual person. It comes from a collective. And no matter what you are into and no matter what you do or what you are passionate about, if you do it in a way that brings people up with you and that thinks about and creatively imagines a different alternative reality, then that is how we create change. So for example, um, I'm thinking about all the time, I'm thinking about climate change all the time and I'm thinking about local government. A way that we decolonize that is we need a devolution of resources and power making decisions from central government down to the local level to our hapu, to our iwi and in the kawanatanga sphere to our local body. So you don't have to be like getting on a panel and talking about constitutional transformation all day long. If everyone just thinks about how it is relevant in their particular area that they're interested in and that you're good at and that motivates you and makes you want to get out of the bed in the morning, then that's all you need to do. You don't have to be the one that leads the big march down from up north down to, to Wellington. Um, and I think the other thing with that is when you're thinking about how can I decolonize or re-indigenize the area that I'm passionate about or my organization or my student group, just remember that like Ree says, I guess Māori are not resources. You can't just email them and say, hey, can we get a coffee and can you just tell me how to like decolonize my group real quick? <laughs> it's about building up trust and that is a universal truth. Even as Māori, I can't go to my, I, I couldn't go to a marae and just say, well, I'm Māori. Can you just tell me real quick about how I um, re-indigenize the climate change space? No, I would have to be in the kitchen doing the dishes for a very long time. I would have to be taking the rubbish out. You have to build up that trust and, and, and show people that you are worthy of their time and their knowledge because that's just a universal thing. So we've got to build up those relationships. Whakawhanaungatanga, it's about having trust in your community and building up those relationships. And then one day they might decide that they want to share some knowledge with you, but they might not as well. But that's just something that we have to do as human beings is make that human connection and actually build up that trust so that we can help each other. And I think another thing, you know, call out racism. If some, or not just racism, call out anything that's problematic in your life because although, you know, I get typecasted as the woke counselor because I'd be doing that, but that's, that's besides the point. We haven't, if we are in rooms where things are being said that we don't agree with, you don't have to necessarily know all the answers, but call it out. D expose racism and the, and the, the, 
imperial system that we have for the ugliness that it is, you know, expose it. And if that's all we do in our lifetime is expose how ugly that system is in the same way that Black Lives Matter is doing with the, with the racism all over the world in the imperialist system, in the same way that we are doing with our policing, when we expose that ugliness, that is, that, that is still, um, you know, a step in and of itself. So call it out and have conversations with your community and your family and your flats, you know, have those active conversations. You might not know all the answers and you might not get it right, but it's through those corridors that we can actually begin to change. So it's about learning. It's about using that learning to make conscious decisions. It's about making conscious decisions that benefit people outside of yourself. It's about building up trust and having connections. It's about, you know, Actively being an agent of change means doing all of those tangible things and learning your own papa. Again, think about the sacrifices that your tipuna had to make for you to be here, even if it wasn't in the most just, socially just way. And maybe, you know, maybe you came over here on a boat and you don't really know exactly why you're here. But, you know, learn about that thing because when you know who you are, then you are able to give back because you know who you are and you can acknowledge that you are here because of the sacrifices of people outside of yourself. And that in and of itself makes you want to do the mahi. Got our team. That's, that's great. And, and as you say, you know, those relationships are very much at the heart of, um, of the Te Tiriti framework, and, but also the way in which we interact day to day um, and, and thinking about how we, how we give back in those relationships as well is really important. Um, let, let's, let's go. We've got some questions here that have come through. So let's, let's address some of those. Um, the, the first one here is uh, how do you propose dealing with those mainly Pākehā who think the treaty discussions are concerned only with settlements and are now largely finished? Treaty settlement. I think it's pretty simple. You just put the lay down the numbers. Like it's pretty clear that the settlement process was a total stitch up when you look at how much of the bloody, how much the how much land is worth now and how much has been given to Māori. Um, something that a real big flaw that I see with the treaty settlement process is that, you know, in in Wellington we only deal with the iwi that, uh, well, we deal with the PSGEs post settlement governance entities um, that were here at the signing of the treaty and that process in and of itself is problematic because there's areas within Wellington that, that are significant to other iwi as well so it's showing the deficiencies of that treaty settlement process and how it's just ripped everybody off. I think also um, the settlement process is primarily concerned with historical grievances and so it's about sort of again challenging those underlying assumptions and saying well actually te tiriti um, you know, as an ongoing relationship. It's not something that can be confined to, oh, yep, we did this bad thing to you. Here's some, here's some putia, or here's a really small part of the land in which you used to um, occupy. And so, you know, it's about dispelling those myths and, and you know, like we said, living the values, living the values of te tiriti um, and tikanga as well. Right, right, yeah, and and as you say, it's the those historical claims. It's about a, a process of providing some redress for those historical claims, but the relationship doesn't end. In fact, this is it's intended to be the platform for renewing the relationship. Um, so you know that's that's still the the, the kind of focus there. Okay, um, let's just move through the next question here, which is. Uh, as we are becoming more multicultural as a society, what is the role of te tiriti and connecting with Tauiwi refugee and migrant communities? Um, sorry, sorry. Um. Well, I think it goes back to values at the end of the day um, and the, the values that can be set out within a system. So I feel like the, the current system that we have is premised on these um, artificial borders that we've, we've drawn up across the planet that um, 
and we've put in these onerous um, kind of processes in which people have to undergo in order to come and call Aotearoa home. Whereas if you had a titiriti based model, you would, that, that's manakitanga. When someone comes here because they need a safe place, a safe refuge, that is unconditional. And not only is it unconditional, we make people have to jump through hoops to feel safe despite the fact despite the conditions that they have to run away from whereas we should really be the ones that manaki them so when people are coming over here we should be the ones that are really putting in that aroha and the truest sense of the word to make sure that they feel safe and that they they start to feel trust so that they can want to become a part of our society so i feel like our immigration processes are rigid and cold and very clinical in and of themselves and so a titiriti based way to look at immigration is that it's about manakitanga and how can we embed that in a process that makes sure that people feel safe and make sure that when they come over here that they can continue to apply the skills or the things that they're passionate about that they um, want to do and contribute to our society um, when they are ready and able to and keen to. So yeah, but I think um, yeah, I think that that that's the role is that we need to make that process easy so that people who come over here feel safe again, and we do what we can in order to advocate if if the the situations or circumstances in their home countries um, are terrible. We want we want them to, we want to be able to um, to provide them with a with a platform and the ability to be able to advocate for the things that they care about and. Um, and give them a safe space as well. So yeah, and I think the 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 inclusive nature of Titiriti means that everyone can practice and celebrate their culture or their religion in Aotearoa without um, fear of discrimination or harassment or harm. And it's about actively creating those spaces where people feel that they can be themselves and where they can express their cultures. And I think a massive challenge for us coming up soon with climate change is that, you know, we are facing a ginormous um, and an almost incomprehensible situation in that as the Pacific sinks, how do we create actively create a space for our Pacific Fano to be able to come here should they want to and to be able to preserve their culture for forever for for all of their uri for all of the people that come after them and so that's a massive conversation that we have and the current system that we have that says that um, Western culture is supreme um, or, or Kiwi culture whatever that is um, that's something that needs to be really stamped out immediately we need to think about what our collective identity is and our culture is but we can only begin to identify that when we know who we are and that goes back to understanding your own whakapapa and where you come from what brings you here and then what brings us all together which is the foundational document te whakaputanga te tiriti those are documents that uh they make who we are so it's about connecting with who we are um and being able to make space for people to be able to come here and to be able to preserve their cultures, practice them safely, and to feel safe and included in a meaningful, non-tokenistic way. Kia ora, Tam. Um, next question I've got here is, uh, what do you think the role of Pākehā is in this Aotearoa transformation and perhaps constitutional transformation more specifically? And are we losing Rihanna. Thanks, Rihanna. Awesome to have you as part of this session. Kia ora, everyone. Thank you. I just have to um, go back and hear the results of my moot. So, aroha mai, um, but I look forward um, to the recording and you can flick us all an email afterwards. Um, kia ora, everyone. Kia ora. So, Tam, this might be well, mate, this might be another question for you. Um, so what do you think the role of Pākehā is in this Aotearoa transformation and perhaps constitutional transformation more specifically? 
Um, so I think it's there um, needs to be an acknowledgement that Pākehā do make up a majority of um, New Zealanders and therefore you have the power and the potential to really drive this conversation and make it relevant to your whānau, to your community. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's tricky though because um, something that I get is that there's a bit of a discomfort there because a lot of Pākehā, they want to help but they don't want to take up too much space. And so I think... Um, if you, I think the, the most, the most powerful way that you can be helpful is that um, it's, it's again goes back to what I was saying before, recognizing and identifying what you are, what you're passionate about, what drives you, no matter what area of society that is within and then really learning with all of the abundant resources that we have at our fingertips with the internet, but also with those connections that you build up through trust, through mahi aroha, that um, once you have that understanding, applying that to all the decisions you make within whichever area that you're in, applying those actively is the first, you know, in an individual capacity, that's the first way that um, you can help us get towards constitutional transformation. But I think the most important way that you can help as well is to um, have those conversations in your community. If you begin to have those conversations, even if the people you're talking to don't necessarily agree with you, that's taking away some labor that a person of color or um, a Māori person has to have with, with those communities. So yeah, and I think conversations are really potent in that they are in a world of, um, and I was saying this the other day in our, in our other workshop on yesterday, um, in a world where there is a lot of information out there, especially with the internet, I think it's really hard for people to distinguish what is true and what isn't. Um, and so a lot of us nowadays, we rely on the opinions of our friends and our family and the people that we love and we trust. And so that is a really under utilized tool for change. You know, have a potluck at your house if you flat. You know, get your flatmates together and and have dinner together and talk about um, any issue that you care about and how titiriti is relevant to that, um, especially with an election coming up. If you live, if you're if you're a professional and you live in a, I guess like a middle class neighbourhood or something like that, have a community pot like get 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 your neighbours around to your house and and have a cordial with them about yeah the upcoming election or or the referenda or or a relevant issue and and really just have a really safe and inclusive cordial about what that means. So it's about actively talking about actively talking about these things, taking some of that labour away from. Um, other groups of people and um, really making your day-to-day -day decisions in your job so professionally and personally being able to strain those through a titiriti lens I think is a really important way that you can um, you can be helpful if you're Pākehā and um, want to help realise constitutional transformation in NZ. Yeah, that's great. And, and I think that partly addresses too one of the other questions that we've got here, which was thinking about um, whether we have any thoughts about how Pākehā might work towards a more kind of grounded understanding of the role of te tiriti. And, and there's another comment there that someone's added around, um, which I think is, is, is kind of addressing partly the role that you talked about, about um, thinking about how to have those safe conversations, thinking about how to take some of the labour off um, from Māori in, in, in having those conversations as well. Um, and I mean, I guess just picking up on some of the other things we've talked about tonight too, that one of the things that I think is a really important thing for um, for all of us to do, but, but I think is can be really helpful for Pākehā as well, is to to um, to find out about their whakapapa and their connection to this place, as you mentioned earlier, Tam, because that that then gives you a, a that gives you those connections, that gives you a point of reference to think about how to engage with that conversation, um, and so I think that that's also really important. Hard out. Um, should I jump to the? Oh, sorry. What the, should, should you go. Question. Um, what role can non-Māori play in the creation of systems which are by Māori and for Māori? You can answer that one, Cowan. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a little bit like you 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 were just talking about in the sense that um, the thing that the thing that non-Māori can do there is to think about 
what is the work that, what, you know, what are the issues that I'm engaged with? What are the conversations that I'm having? How do I bring them, how do I support um, Māori to be in those spaces or to have those conversations? Um, you know, one of the things that, that, that we talked about a lot in our, um, in the work that we did with the Justice Advisory Group was that the thing that's going to really make the change is that will make politicians make the change is when they see that there is popular support for something, when, when people are uh, pushing this as an issue. And that, as you, again, you mentioned before, that's one of the things that Pākehā can be really helpful with because they are a majority um, and so have a, a, a different kind of political voice um, and can speak to, to different kinds of constituencies as well. So it's really about reflecting on um, you know, partly what space am I taking up, um, reflecting on how can I um, support Māori, how can I support things that are Māori-led um, and, and um, to, because of course the, the essence of by Māori for Māori is that those, those things are Māori-led. 100% and I think yeah just even that that word creation like I think that's the the other thing that um, is really key is that it's less creating the systems and more reconnecting with them because I think that's the really key yeah the, the really key point here is that we through colonization has really done a number on our memory and um, the way that we can connect with um, any any solution that we wish to find it's about again honing our memories and being able to um, re-identify what those are and so in terms of the creation of systems all of us can benefit from going back and actually learning about um, what those systems might have been and I've been doing that a lot with the different kaupapa that I'm um, interested in I'm thinking I'm, I'm, I'm going and reading books and resources about um, what were the traditional or indigenous ways that um, we dealt with a particular issue? And if we haven't done that, then um, I'm sure our, you know, our whanau in the Pacific has found a way to deal with it. And if not, there might be some hints around the world um, with other indigenous communities to find these solutions. So, yeah, I think we prop up these new um, ideas a lot too. You know, we say, oh my gosh, look at that. Um, especially in the way that we, um, like, like, um, looking at things like regenerative agriculture and stuff, we, we prop up these new ways of um, doing all of these things. However, if we take a step back, we can find that there's actually a lot simpler ways to do things that are natural to Aotearoa and will work because they have worked before. So it's about reconnecting with those and everybody can do that. You know, the internet again is a free tool for most people if you're able to access it. So if you're able to, just reconnect with those methods and learn about those. And obviously don't, maybe don't explain to a Māori person that system, you know, just say, oh, I, I, did, I, I saw this thing, like maybe this could work, you know, just don't, yeah, don't do that. But um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, and I see, I see someone um, in the Q&A part has also added a link to some uh, resources. And, and as you're saying, Tam, there's, there's plenty of resources available and you know one of the things that people might want to do is to think about seeking out um, things to read or listen to or engage with um, on, on the internet as well. Um, just the one probably last question that we might deal with um, is a question about structural change and change to systems and thinking and whether um, we think that the common law, the courts, could be an effective path for change. Um, and there's a reference to the uh, Peter Ellis appeal. Um, I might just address the, the kind of specific common law courts part, but I think there's a broader question there, Tam, about um, thinking ab about the, as you've talked about, the kind of Westminster system uh, that, that we're based on. So we might just come back, I'll come back to you in a, in a minute. But there's a really interesting issue coming through uh, the courts at the moment, the Supreme Court is in the, is, has heard uh, the, the appeal of Peter Ellis. Um, some of you might be familiar with this case. It, it was a high profile case, goes back to the 1990s and number of convictions that Peter Ellis had. Um, now, he had been through a number of appeals and last year he was 
uh, the Supreme Court had granted him leave to appeal to the Supreme Court. And, uh, but before the hearing was held, Peter Ellis died. And then the question became, should the appeal continue given that the person who was appealing had died? And the kind of common law assumption was, well, um, no, that's, that's the end of the matter. There's no more issue for us to determine. But what was, when they, the hearing got to the Supreme Court, uh, a couple of the judges started asking questions about, well, does tikanga Māori have anything to say about this? Um, you know, if, if we're thinking of tikanga as part of our foundational system of law, as contributing to the New Zealand common law, as distinct from the English common law, um, should we be considering questions of tikanga? And so there's just recently the court have heard those issues around tikanga and have, have be been beginning to address um, thinking, we don't know what the decision will be yet, but, but certainly interested in those questions around, you know, does tikanga Māori say something different to what the assumptions of the English common law is? And if so, should New Zealand common law carve out a new path? So there are some really interesting moves afoot there, um, and it does have the potential to quite fundamentally shape our New Zealand legal system. But I think that, you know, there are still some real limitations around how the New Zealand state legal system operates. And so I think there are questions around well, what are the constraints and the parameters on that? Um, and does it get to the kind of structural change that, that we've been talking about? So I'll hand over to you for any more thoughts about structural change, Tam. Um, to be honest, I don't have much to add because um, I think, yeah, no, you just, yep, that was excellent. Um, I guess it's really like from a, an outside perspective, um, it's really cool the way that, um, that it, it's really, I, I find it really inspiring the kind of creative ways in which um, people are coming up with ways to work within the current systems to find creative solutions to get to re-indigenizing. So for example, at council, you know, we are subject to different like national policy statements. And so I've seen, um, I've seen, I think I caught the end of the national policy statement on freshwater management, which, um, outline te mana o te wai, and then obviously that's being used as a successful tool in the environmental court um, held, I think it was, oh, I don't oh, I don't know the specifics, don't, you, all you law students, don't you call me out on this, because I don't know, but like, um, the way that the, I think it was an iwi down south, or hapu down south, um, held the, held like a local body accountable for polluting a waterway, and they used the concept of te mana o te wai as a, um, as a, as their legal foundation in one and then with this new another um, national policy statement that's come through late last year which is around protecting native um, biodiversity so our indigenous trees and birds and bugs and all that um, and that concept is called hutia terito and that's similar in that it gives it it gives oh, I don't know the right terminology but it gives some kind of a legal expression or grounds to protect um, these different, you know, elements in a way that is, I guess, premised around tikanga Māori. It might not be perfect, but, um, you know, we're finding these creative ways to work within the system to um, create that change. And then there's the obvious ones, like the legal uh, legal personhood of, um, yeah, um, the Whanganui River, as you talked about, Kawin, um, and um, of, you know, uh, Te Uruwera and all of those kind of cool um creative ways to entwine um, different concepts. Um, but yeah, so like, obviously that's not going to be the thing that helps, but in the meantime, I think finding those creative ways and learning about those, um, those creative and indigenous concepts and the way that they're being used um, to hold these systems to account, I think is, um, is, is all I'd really add to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we might, um, we're out of time, um, so we might bring things to a close. Um, I just wanted to, in closing, to, we talked about Matariki uh, at the very beginning, and I just again want to encourage people to think about some of those, those ideas around reflection, um, around 
then thinking about innovation and then planning for how you're going to make those changes and in that innovation. And so in, um, Tam and Rihanna both talked about the ways in which you might think about um, kind of embedding te tiriti in a te, te tiriti lens in your kind of daily life and whatever activities you're involved in, whatever the issues are that interest you, whatever conversations you might be having with people. So think about whether, you know, what conversations are you going to have, what steps are you are going to take, what resources are you going to seek out to, to um, kind of develop and innovate um, as we move through this time of matariki. So I'll close in a moment with um, a karakia, but just first uh, really wanted to thank uh, my, my co-facilitators, um, Tam, who's, who's still here, um, and Rihanna, of course, who, who was able to join us and make the contributions that she did. Really a real pleasure being part of the session with uh, both you two. And also just to thank uh, the... Uh, the folks uh, who have organised this leadership week and the different sessions that ha that uh, have been taking place that this is part of. Um, and of course, everyone who's joined in, been participating tonight, asking some great questions there to move the discussion along and really demonstrating the kind of engaged thinking that that, that is really helpful for progressing these kinds of issues and conversations. So ngā mihi nui ki a koutou, and I'll just um, finish by closing with uh, karakia. Te whakai a tanga e, te whakai a tanga e, tēnei te kaupapa ka ea, tēnei te wānanga ka ea, te mauri o te kaupapa ka whakamuia, te mauri o te wānanga ka whakamuia, koa ki runga, koa ki raro, haumie, huie, tāiki e. Kia ora koutou.